Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. This week, we told you a secret about the Chinese military. Some of their missiles have water instead of fuel, so they don't fire. But where did the fuel go? Apparently, the soldiers used it to cook their food. They were short of supplies, so they helped themselves to military equipment. Says who? A whistleblower who used to serve as a lieutenant colonel in the PLA. We'll bring you the full details as he busts China's propaganda and myths of a powerful, seemingly invincible military force. Meanwhile, in India, the president of the UAE attended a major investors' a summit. We look at the deepening ties between Modi and MBZ, and by extension, their respective countries. In Ecuador, drama straight out of Hollywood. Gunmen take over a live TV studio as the country grapples with an emergency. In Poland, it's the president versus the prime minister. Police arrest opposition MPs who'd sought refuge in the presidential palace. In Taiwan, they're preparing for an election under the shadow of China. In the Red Sea, the biggest Houthi attacks on ships so far. In Las Vegas, tech gadgets of the future on display. In Gulmarg, a winter without the blanket of snow. In Italy, furore over the Nazi salute. And in the world of toys, bridging the divide between pink and blue. We'll tell you how the trend began in the first place. All this and more coming up, the headlines first. As the Israel-Hamas war rages on, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken meets Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas as the U.S. supports the creation of a Palestinian state. The meeting in West Bank comes a day after Blinken met Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Ukrainian President visits his Baltic allies amid doubts over aid from the West. The visit to Lithuania, Estonia and Latvia was unannounced. It is Zelensky's first official trip abroad this year, 2024. It comes amid the West's wavering support for Ukraine as the war with Russia nears two years. Big win for the President of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Constitutional Court confirms President Felix Chisikedi's landslide victory. The president had secured a second term in the recently held elections. Nine opposition candidates had rejected the results, calling for a rerun. Major relief for Imran Khan's party, the PTI. The Peshawar High Court gives them back their bat election symbol. The court called the election commission's decision to revoke it illegal. Pakistan goes to polls on the 8th of February. India cracks down on offshore crypto exchanges. Apple removes apps of platforms like Binance, Qcoin and OKX. Last month, New Delhi sent a show cause notice to nine offshore platforms. In 2023, India had imposed money laundering provisions on the crypto sector. And in a major reversal, Thailand moves to ban recreational use of cannabis. This comes just 18 months after Bangkok criminalized it. In 2022, Thailand became the first Asian country to legalize cannabis, but the new Thai Prime Minister has backed banning recreational cannabis. When I say the PLA, what is it that comes to your mind? Here's what China wants you to think of. The headlines they like. Headlines like, the PLA remains a powerful force. China has more warships than the US. China has the world's largest navy. You get the drift. This is what they've been selling the world. This is the perception that they've built, painstakingly projecting the PLA as a powerful force. And since China has not fought a war in 45 years, we haven't really seen proof of this power. We've not seen them in, them in action. We just have to take their word for it. And the videos that they circulate, like this one, take a look. You saw that. Drones for food delivery. Freshly prepared meals for soldiers delivered by drones. Two years back, China was boasting about all of this. The PLA even showed off this app. 
What does it do? It works like Swiggy or Zomato, but for the Chinese military. The soldiers have a tablet. It's a food delivery app. They can use it to order fresh food and it gets delivered to their post wherever they're posted. Or does it? Is this all part of Chinese propaganda? They want the world to believe that theirs is the best equipped force and that their soldiers have the best of everything from weapons to food supplies. But here's the other side of that story. Chinese soldiers stealing to make ends meet. Soldiers stranded without supplies, removing fuel from missiles to cook food. And I'm not the one saying this. A Chinese soldier is. He's given a tell-all interview and busted China's lies, shown the world the wide gap between China's propaganda and China's reality. So who is the soldier? His name is Yao Cheng. He served as a lieutenant colonel in the Chinese Navy. But in 2016, Yao fled China. He's believed to be living in the US now, and he's revealed some embarrassing details. He says Chinese soldiers face serious shortages. They don't have the food supplies they need, so how do they survive? Yao says the soldiers cannibalize their military supplies. They drain fuel from rockets and use it to cook food. He said all of this in an interview. I have some quotes. And this is what he said. When I was in the military, we would drain fuel from aircraft fuel tanks for cooking, which burns green and has no smell at all. I would often go along to the armory and ask them for a small round piece of solid fuel when we wanted to have hot pot. This is what the soldier has said. And what does it tell you? Chinese soldiers cook their own food using stolen fuel. What about the fancy food deliveries? Is that a lie? Here's another myth that China loves propagating. The PLA is a well-funded military. It has abundant resources and all the money it needs. If you look at their budget allocations, you'd be inclined to believe it. In 2023, China's military budget was $224 billion, amongst the highest in the world. But apparently, China's military budget is inadequate. And the PLA whistleblower has confirmed this. He said some departments have no money whatsoever. So funds are misappropriated all the time. Let me quote from the interview again. Some military departments have no money, and if they need money, their chief has to allocate some from the equipment budget. The equipment budget would have been, suf would, would have been sufficient, but not after being misappropriated. The budget for dinners and gifts is taken from the equipment budget. So the Chinese military is leaking cash. Xi Jinping claims to be spending billions on the PLA. He wants a modern fighting force with powerful weapons. And that's where the money is supposed to go. The Chinese government clears a large military budget every year. It allocates money for upgrades. But this money is being spent elsewhere, sometimes out of necessity, some other times because of corruption. And that brings me to the third myth. The Chinese military is efficient. Its officers are loyal to the Communist Party. Even Xi Jinping does not believe this, which is why he keeps firing his generals. Since taking power in 2013, he has removed hundreds of military officials, mostly over corruption charges. And even after that, the Chinese president is not satisfied. A fresh crackdown is underway as we speak. More than 10 high-profile officials have been sagged, including a defense minister. On Monday, Xi Jinping held a meeting. He spoke about the purges. He said more work needs to be done. The situation remains grave and complex. That's what Xi Jinping said. So he's removing military officials left, right and center. And this is what the big picture looks like. There is corruption, inadequate resources and soldiers running out of supplies. What does that tell you? The PLA may not be the formidable, formidable force that the world believed it to be. It's just another Chinese creation, big on hype low on substance. How do you judge bilateral relations? Substance, yes, but also some good chemistry and pomp. Rarely do countries tick both boxes. So tonight, we are talking about two countries that do, India and the United Arab Emirates, UAE. The UAE's president landed in India on Tuesday. His name is Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan also known as MBZ, Mohammed bin Zayed. He landed in Modi's home state of Gujarat. The Prime Minister personally welcomed him at the airport. The two men share a close relationship. They've met four times in seven months. 
and the pictures reflect that warmth. Take a look. MBZ came to Gujarat to attend an investors forum. It's called Vibrant Gujarat. Next month, Prime Minister Modi will travel to the UAE. He has two events lined up. First is Elan Modi. Some of you may remember Howdy Modi in the US. Well, this is the UAE version. Modi will attend a public gathering of Indians in the UAE. Some 50,000 people are expected to attend. The second event is a temple inauguration. It's a big deal for the UAE. MBZ himself had gifted the land to build this temple. So that's pomp and chemistry check. Now we come to the substance. Why is this relationship important for India? Why has Prime Minister Modi invested so much in it? For three major reasons. Number one, trade and investments. The UAE is among the top five suppliers of oil to India. It's also a stable resource, stable source of oil, in fact. In November, Russian oil discounts were drying up. So guess who India turned to? The UAE. India's oil imports from the UAE increased by 35%. We bought more than 300,000 barrels per day. Even non-oil trade is growing. Back in 2022, India and the UAE signed a free trade deal. Most goods are now tariff-free. No tax. As a result, non-oil trade is $50 billion. The target is $100 billion by 2030. Same with investments. The UAE is the fourth largest investor in India. They invested some $3.3 billion in the last financial year. $3.3 billion. So there's a lot of money involved. That's the first reason. Reason number two is a strategic outreach. The Western media loves questioning India's secular credentials, especially when it comes to Muslims. Even Western governments talk about it. But guess who hasn't? The likes of the UAE and Saudi Arabia. So these pictures are a response to that Western criticism. It is proof that India is a friend of the Muslim world. Finally, reason number three, to counter Pakistan. It's been a worry right from independence because Pakistan is a Muslim country. So are the UAE and other Gulf nations. What if they support Islamabad on Kashmir? What if they gang up at global platforms, global forums. To prevent that, India has played the long game. It has made itself indispensable to Gulf nations. And today, relations are dehyphenated. Just look at Kashmir. Last year, the region got its first foreign project, a shopping mall worth $60 million. Do you know who's building it? The UAE's Emar Group. So relations have matured and evolved over the years. First, it was about tackling Pakistan. Then it was about energy supplies. The question is, what comes next? I'll tell you why I asked this. We are heading towards an oil-free world, and Pakistan is not India's peer anymore. So where does this relationship go? How does it evolve? Well, MB MBZ and Modi are laying a roadmap. They're looking to diversify this relationship. And both leaders deserve a lot of credit for this. Modi refers to MBZ as his brother. He praised the Emirati leader for steering bilateral ties. Bharat and UAE have just given their relationships a new level. He has a very big story of my brother, His Highness, سیخ محمد بن جائد کو جاتا ہے سیدی نحن سعداء جدا بالمشارکہ مع اصدقائنا فی الہند والعالم فی هذه القمة لنبعث جميعا ما يسعد شعوبنا ویطور دولنا MBZ is not much of a public speaker he rarely addresses public gatherings but yesterday in Gujarat he did tells you how important this relationship is. And chances are, this chemistry will continue because MBZ is president for life and Prime Minister Modi looks set for a third term in office. So they have a chance to cement the future of India-UAE relations.
I must say that's not what a normal day of journalism looks like, but that's Ecuador's new reality. A crime around every corner. Let's look at what happened on Tuesday. A live broadcast was underway at TC Channel. Their studio is located in Ecuador's largest city. Suddenly, masked men broke in. They pointed their guns at the staff and presenters. They held them hostage. Some of this was broadcast live on the channel, but after a while, the feed was cut. Then came the police. They carried out a special operation to free the hostages. 13 attackers have been arrested. Two employees sustained injuries. Listen to the presenter recount his escape. Through our earpieces, the producers told us, be careful, they are trying to enter, they are stealing, they are mugging us. The doors in the studio are very thick, almost bulletproof. And they were trying to get in because they wanted to gain access to the studio so we could say whatever they wanted to say. So what's happening here? Gunmen do not randomly attack TV studios. Clearly, there's something more at play. The question is, what is that something? Well, it all started over the weekend. A notorious crime lord escaped from jail. They call him Fito. Since then, all hell has broken loose. Prisoners have taken more than 150 guards hostage. Around 40 inmates have escaped, 4-0. Police officers have been kidnapped. Vehicles have been attacked. And now TV studios are being taken over. We don't know if this attack is linked to Fito. But it fits in with the larger picture, the picture of lawlessness. Again, we come to the question, why? Why is this happening? How did gangs and crime lords come to dominate Ecuador? Because of two reasons. One is location. Ecuador is a country in Latin America. To its north is Colombia. To its south is Peru. Both are top cocaine-producing countries, Colombia and Peru. They're home to cartels and drug lords. So in Ecuador, gangs have always existed. That's the first reason, its location. Reason number two, economic decline. The Wuhan virus pandemic hit Ecuador hard. Poverty is now at 38%. And within that, there is a demographic divide. 70% people in rural areas are poor. It's 23% in urban areas. So people do not have jobs to make money. So what do they do? Many youngsters slip into the world of crime. The United Nations says poverty is the biggest reason for the rising violence here. And the numbers are scary. In 2022, Ecuador reported more than 4,000 violent deaths. Last year, it rose to more than 8,000. One of the victims was a presidential candidate, killed in violence, a presidential candidate. So gang violence is not new in Ecuador. It's always existed. But now the gangs have sort of united. And their common enemy? The government. On Monday, the president declared a state of emergency on Instagram. That's where he, he made the announcement. The emergency will last for 60 days. The plan is to neutralize the gang members. Even the military is on board. A partir de este momento, From this moment, all terrorist groups identified in the president's decree is a military target. The present and the future of our homeland is at stake, and no act of terror will make us give up. We will not step back nor negotiate good. Justice and order can't ask for permission or bow their head in front of terrorists. So what's the end game here? The government is prepared for an all-out war. Their president is upgrading his military. It will cost some $800 million, out of which $200 million will come from the U.S. So he's ready for battle. But what will be the impact of this campaign? Regionally, we can think of three issues. One is more financial trouble. Shops and malls have shut down. People are scared to keep their businesses open. What if they are targeted next? Issue number two, refugees. When violence breaks out, people flee. Tens of thousands have already left the country. They're traveling north towards the U.S. And issue number three is spillovers. Neighboring Peru has declared an emergency along its border. The idea is to contain the conflict, to make sure gangs do not take refuge in Peru. So there's a lot at stake here. Ecuador is the eighth largest economy in the region, also a key U.S. ally. In fact, their official currency is the U.S. dollar. Ecuador is also important in the export market. They're the largest producers of banana. They also make up 70% of upper-class cocoa bean output. So it's not just mindless violence halfway across the world. Ecuador's street war has implications for itself, for Latin America, and for the world.
Now let's talk about Taiwan. It is in election mode this weekend. The island will get a new president. But the final, the final days of campaigning have seen two controversies erupt. The first row involves the current president, Tsai Ing-wen. She's on her way out. But even in her last days in office, she's facing a new challenge. An audio recording is doing the rounds. It is believed to feature President Tsai. And what is the conversation about? A host of issues. The recording is 41 minutes long. There is one exchange that stands out. It's about Joseph Wu, Taiwan's current foreign minister. The lawmaker is complaining to President Tsai about Joseph Wu. He's talking about promotions in the foreign ministry. He says foreign minister Joseph Wu has disrupted the hierarchy and promoted, and I'm quoting, unqualified officials. Apparently, some of them are linked to the Kuomintang or KMT. That's Taiwan's main opposition party, Kuomintang. Decades back, the KMT ruled over mainland China. They were in power from 1927 to 1949. They fought the Communist Party in a civil war and lost control of the mainland. The KMT was defeated. Their leaders fled to Taiwan. But today's KMT is a very different group. It has a different political leaning. Today's KMT is seen as pro-China. It wants closer ties with the mainland. So when some of its former officials got promotions, it did not sit well with members of the DPP, the ruling party. This is what the audio tape suggests. President Tsai is yet to comment about it, and the tape's authenticity is still being questioned. But pro-China voices in Taiwan are using it to push their agenda. A few days ago, President Tsai held a press conference. She made an appeal to voters. She said democracy should dictate the course of Taiwan's ties with China. What is the future of cross-strait relations? I think it should be consistent with the principles of democracy. This is taking the joint will of Taiwan's people to make a decision. After all, we are a democratic country. The course to follow on relations with China will have to follow the democratic process. And that process is being challenged, which brings us to the second controversy in this election. It, invo it involves this woman, Ma Chi Wei. She's running as an independent. She has filed her candidacy from Tao Yuan. That's a city in Taiwan. Last weekend, Ma was detained. Some shocking revelations have been made. Apparently, Ma was planted by China. China asked her to contest the election and reportedly even funded her campaign. And how did they do it? Well, here is the backstory. It all began last year. Ma paid a visit to China in April 2023. Reports say she met Communist Party officials and they told her to run for office. They struck a deal. Money changed hands. How much? Around $32,000. China transferred this money through cryptocurrency. It was their first campaign contribution. Through the rest of the year, Ma made more visits to China. She wanted more money to finance her campaign. And apparently, China was happy to help. The contributions came in US dollars and in cryptocurrency. But Taiwan's investigators caught up with her. She's now in detention and most likely disqualified from the election. For the others, campaigning is entering its final phase. The polls open on Saturday. This will be a close fight and controversies like these could sway the undecided voters. The fate and the future of Taiwan hang in the balance. Now let's turn our attention to Poland. It's a, a country in Central Europe. And what's happened there is not a missile or a bomb strike. There's been an attack in Poland, but this attack was on the authority of the Polish president. His name is Andrzej Duda, and his position is at risk. A power struggle is on between President Duda and Prime Minister Donald Tusk. Yesterday, the latest salvo was fired. The Warsaw police raided the presidential palace. They went in to capture two fugitives, fugitives who also happened to be members of parliament. The police went to arrest them, two MPs. They're opposition MPs. Their party lost the last election, so now they're in the opposition. And they now have a target on their backs. Polish courts have found them guilty of abuse of power, and it looks like the new government, the government of Prime Minister Donald Tusk, is hunting them down, even going into the hallowed halls of the presidential palace. Apparently, everyone knew 
that the two MPs were inside under President Duda's protection. His office had even posted pictures with the men. And this was supposed to be a signal to the government for the police to back off. But they did not. Instead, they raided the presidential palace. They entered when Duda stepped out, and that's not all. The real insult to Duda is that he'd already pardoned these two MPs. All the way back in 2015, that's when he first became president. He pardoned these MPs, and he gave them refuge in the presidential palace. And yet, they've been arrested. As you can imagine, Duda is not happy. I'm deeply shaken by this situation. The fact that former ministers Mariesh Kaminsky and Mashiesh Wasik were put in prison despite presidential pardon and that it was done in such zeal and such brutality. Duda says he will not rest until the MPs are free. He has called for calm. He says any protests must be peaceful, but the opposition party supporters are angry. They enter the presidential palace and arrest people. The presidential palace is akin to an embassy. People seek refuge from repression. Yet someone questions the presidential pardon. Who is above the president? This government, right now, seems to operate outside the bounds of the law. I don't want to offend anyone, but I feel like I'm living in a banana republic. He asked who is above the president. Well, that's a tricky question, especially in Poland. You see, the president's pardon was not randomly ignored by the new, new government. It was actually struck down by Poland's Supreme Court. It was also the court that ordered the arrest of these two MPs. So the question becomes, is the president above the courts? Now, here's what the court said, that the two men were pardoned too early. They did not go through all the appeal processes. A presidential pardon should be a tool of last resort, not something to use the minute a friend or ally gets into trouble. So that's why Poland Supreme Court invalidated Duda's pardon and the two MPs were sentenced to prison again. But the Polish president and the opposition do not accept this. Neither do some of the other courts. Courts packed with former government loyalists. They believe it is a ploy by the new Tusk regime. Another political and ideological battle. You see, Poland's previous government was right-wing nationalist. They frequently clashed with the European Union over Poland's internal law and order issues that violated EU policies. They were at loggerheads. But the new Prime Minister, Donald Tusk, is pro-EU. He was even the president of the European Council a few years ago. So he is the complete opposite of his predecessor. And what about the president? President Duda was appointed by the previous government. There's a divide between him and the prime minister, which is why Tusk is accused of undermining the president's authority. But Tusk remains defiant. He has chosen to double down and question Duda's role. The crown would not fall from his head even if he were to acknowledge there is a legal dispute. This dispute arises from the belief that the first pardon was ineffective and therefore it should be reopened. No one would be bothering him about it and he could put an end to this unnecessary show. The retort directed at Duda will not be taken well. It will likely exacerbate the situation. And these two still have to spend months working together because Poland's next presidential election is scheduled for May 2025. Until then... We'll probably see more bickering like this. Poland's dual power centers will keep clashing and the people will most likely suffer due to, due to poor governance. In the Red Sea, the Houthis are still at it, attacking ships at will. On Tuesday, they launched 21 drones and missiles, all aimed at shipping vessels. It was their largest attack yet, but warships from the US and the UK shot them down. No one was injured, nothing was damaged, except for business confidence. Shipping companies are spooked. After all, this was the 26th Houthi attack in less than two months, and by the looks of it, it won't stop until the war in Gaza stops. About 12% of global trade passes through the Red Sea, and these attacks are bleeding businesses. Our next report tells you more. It was around 9.15 local time. The Houthis were gearing up. One-way attack drones, anti-ship cruise missiles, anti-ship ballistic missiles. They had it all. And soon they launched 21 of them. It was targeted at shipping vessels in the Red Sea. 
The Navy, Rocket Forces and the Air Force of the Yemeni Armed Forces carried out a joint military operation using a significant number of ballistic missiles, naval assets and drones targeting an American ship that was providing support to the Zionist entity. So the target was an American ship, but around 50 vessels were in the area. Any one of them could have been hit. But before that happened, the US and the UK jumped into action. 18 drones, two cruise missiles and one ballistic missile. They were all shot down. It was taken down by a combination of British and American warplanes and destroyers. So no one got hurt and nothing was damaged. But it was the largest attack by the Houthis and it's gone on for quite some time now. In November, the Houthis warned the West. They said they would target Israeli-owned or Israel-bound vessels. This was to protest against the war in Gaza. And they've lived up to their promise. Since November 19th, the Houthis have launched multiple attacks. Tuesday's attack was their 26th one in just three months. Of course, this has left ships spooked. 12% of annual global trade passes through the Red Sea. That's $1 trillion worth of goods. Container ships carry oil, consumer goods, all sorts of material. This is obviously not good news for them, which is why they are redirecting ships. Ships usually use this route through the Suez Canal. It's the quickest sea route between Asia and Europe. The alternative is a much longer one. It's around Africa's Cape of Good Hope. This adds 3,500 nautical miles to the journey, which means it will need more time, more fuel, more crew and more money. Shipping rates have risen over 4% in the last one week and it will rise further, which means someone will have to bear the cost and it's likely to be the customer. So get ready for things to get more expensive. But is there a solution? America has offered one. It's a multinational task force, an alliance of sorts. Many nations have joined. Together, they are guarding the Red Sea. The warships that took down the drones and missiles were part of this. Some other countries like India have also sent their warships. There are patrols and increased security, but some shipping companies still remain reluctant. And Tuesday's attack showed why. The US and the UK may have prevented it, but will they be able to thwart every Houthi attack in the Red Sea? Now to Las Vegas, where one of the world's biggest tech shows is taking place. It's called the CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. Now, CES is a brand in itself, and all the world's tech giants have come to this year's gala. Like every year, big tech is showing off the latest toys. The flavor of the season is AI. AI-powered companion robots, AI-powered massage robots, AI-powered car dashboards. The letters AI will be flashing everywhere you look. But thankfully, that's not all. You also have transparent TVs, robot baristas, and cars that can crab walk. Our next report brings you our top, top five gadgets from CES 2024 so far. Why is it called a steering wheel? Who decreed that cars needed a fifth wheel inside? Why can't you use something else to direct your car? It seems the people at Sony were asking these very questions. And they got together with Honda to come up with an alternative. The result? Say hello to the Afila. First, allow me to bring the latest prototype on stage. But today, I will be using this. The car can be maneuvered with a PlayStation 5 controller. Just your regular run-of-the-mill PS5 remote. It seems like every racing game fan's dream come true. The Afila is an electric vehicle, so you'll have to charge both the car and controller before going out for a spin. Of course, that is still a while away. The Afila isn't expected to hit the market before 2026. But the concept is unique enough to make it into our top 5 at CES list. Staying with cars, let's turn to their rival Hyundai's new concept. It's called the Mobian. Nothing special to look at. At least, not until you take a peek at its wheels. The Mobian selling point is its mobility. The wheels go everywhere. And that means the car can too. 
With this car, you'll never have to worry about parallel parking again. Imagine that. Next up, we have this. This strange tank with digital fish. Except, instead of water, it fills up with the color black to provide better contrast for your viewing experience. For you see, the tank is actually a TV. A wireless OLED transparent TV that you can transform into a showpiece at the click of a button. Both LG and Samsung are showing off these new age television sets. And they'll be racing to release them by the end of the year. But before that, Samsung may end up making TVs obsolete altogether. With this little guy, a home companion robot enhanced with AI named Bolly. Everyone at the CES has been rushing to bring AI to their projects. And Samsung is no different there. But in this case, it could really change the game. The robot will use AI to map out your house floor plan, learn your habits, especially regarding appliance use and light switches. No, it's not a stalker. Just an AI-enhanced helper that can take care of annoying chores you forgot to do. And it can also project things onto your walls, getting rid of the need for fixed screens. At least, that's the concept. And if you like AI-enhanced robot helpers, our last pick may really hit the spot in the best way possible. Rounding up our top five from the CES so far is this robot masseuse. A French firm has created this robot to soothe your weary muscles, or tissues, or even an exhausted mind. It will use AI to pick the best massage for you. As you can imagine, the robot was a hit at the show. Artificial intelligence is very important for us. So there is a scanner, a 3D scanner, that sees the morphology of the user and just really adapt all the massage that, is, that has been uh, created by a specialist, a, a physiotherapist. That's it for our top five picks of CES 2024 so far. There will be more technological marvels on display over the next few days, allowing us to get a glimpse into the future. There will be more technological marvels on display over the next few days, allowing us to get a glimpse into the future. Let me ask you a question. What's the most offensive act you can think of? Something that provokes, something linked to violence or trauma. In most of Europe, it's this, the Nazi salute. In Adolf Hitler's time, this is how Nazis greeted each other, right arm held up and palm facing down. It was one of the most visible symbols of Nazism and today it brings back trauma, of wars, of persecution and of hardships which is why scenes from Italy have made people uncomfortable. Take a look at what happened on Sunday. That happened in Rome. Outside the former office of a neo-fascist party, it's called the Italian Social Movement, the party does not exist anymore, it has merged into a new one, the Brothers of Italy Party. Does the name ring a bell? It should. Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni belongs to the same party, Brothers of Italy. So the opposition is attacking her. They want Meloni to ban neo-fascist groups. And the reason is simple. In the 1920s, fascists captured power in Italy. They were led by dictator Benito Mussolini. He crushed democracy in the country. He also led Italy into World War II. So symbols of Nazism and fascism are considered evil, especially the salute. Now for the record, neither Hitler nor Mussolini invented the salute. It dates back to the Roman Empire, but today it is a provocation. It's considered controversial. Giorgia Maloney has not said anything yet, but in the past she has distanced herself 
from fascism. Listen to the speech from 2022. I have never felt any sympathy or closeness to undemocratic regimes, any regime for that matter. Just as I have always considered the racial laws of 1938 the lowest point in Italian history. It's a shame that will forever mark our people. And yet questions remain. Her party elected a leader called Ignazio La Russa, a speaker. La Russa is a collector of fascist relics. His father was secretary of Mussolini's fascist party. Another example is this man. He's now a junior minister in Maloney's cabinet. In this old picture, he's wearing this armband. It was a Nazi symbol. So there is reason for criticism. But can a ban solve this problem? Well, some countries are trying it out, like Australia. They've banned the Nazi salute and the symbol. If you display those, you could land in jail. The maximum punishment is 12 months. The law was proposed and passed last year. It's a response to rising anti-Semitism after the Hamas attack on Israel. So Canberra is sticking to bans. Countries in Europe have done the same, like Germany, Austria and the Czech Republic. These countries explicitly ban the Nazi salute. Others like Switzerland and Sweden have similar laws, but have they really worked? We've always said that banning is never an answer, but if anything deserves to be banned, it is this Nazi symbols. Yet everyone is convinced, not everyone is convinced rather. Many critics point to Germany. It has banned Nazi symbols since the 1950s, but neo-Nazis are on the rise. In 2021, right-wing extremism reached a 20-year high. In 2022, far-right groups plotted a coup. So banning alone is not enough. You must address the root causes of the ideology, whether it's lack of, of awareness or ignorance of history or the lack of messaging. If you think about it, Germany has done pretty well on these counts. They don't hide the Nazi crimes. They make sure children learn about it. Yet they have a neo-Nazi problem. So imagine the situation elsewhere. My point is quite simple. Legal action alone is not enough. Just Think beyond just a ban. That's where Italy failed after the Second World War. They banned the fascist party in the 1940s, but the ideology did not die. Fascists organized themselves into new groups. Same ideology, different name. So do not hide behind bans and legal actions. Think beyond and speak out. Because in such cases, a simple condemnation goes a long way. To India now, let's talk about the two pictures that you see behind me. Both are of Gulmarg, both these pictures. Gulmarg is an idyllic town in Kashmir. In winter, it turns into a snowy wonderland. On my right is a snow-covered Gulmarg. It attracts tourists every year. They come from across the globe to enjoy the snow, to take part in winter activities and to ski down the slopes. But this year, Gulmarg has no snow, like you can see in the picture on my left. The land is not white, it is barren with small specks of snow. What happened to the white blanket of Gulmarg? Our next report tells you why there is no snow. Located 60 kilometers from Srinagar lies the town of Gulmarg, known as the Meadow of Flowers. Gulmarg is a sight to behold in winters. It turns into a snow-covered paradise and a premier winter sports destination. You can walk on the snow-covered slopes. You can ski down them. Or if none of that suits you, take the world's second highest gondola to witness the picturesque snow valleys. In 2023, 1.65 million tourists visited Gulmarg. This winter, it was supposed to be higher. Many are already in town, expecting a fresh bout of snow but they are shocked by the sights because Gulmarg is snowless this winter. The land is barren, it's more brown than white. There are tiny specks of snow, almost like a consolation. So why is there no snow in Gulmarg? The weather office says it's due to a dry spell in Kashmir. This year the Kashmir Valley has received 79% less rainfall. There's been virtually no snow all season. The whole of December was dry. January 2 is likely to be the same. But why is that? It's because of climate change. Gulmarg's snowless winter is due to the El Nino phenomenon. 
It's a climate pattern that leads to warming of Pacific waters. It tends to create warmer than average weather. And that's happening in India. This year, it's witnessing a shorter winter. And places like Kashmir may see virtually no snow. Netizens are already expressing concern. Some say the sight is shocking. Others have resorted to skiing on a man-made ice rink. Former Jammu and Kashmir Chief Minister Omar Abdullah also spoke about it. He says he's never seen Gulmarg so dry and that there's nothing to ski on. For the town, this is scary. Gulmarg depends on tourism every year. It's how the town survives and it usually booms every winter. Lacks of tourists come for the snow and with no snow on the ground, many are cancelling. Plus, there are the skiing enthusiasts. They want to ski down snowy slopes, not barren ones. Also, India's winter games will be held in the town from February 2nd. That could be affected too. For now, Gulmarg is only hoping for one thing, snow. But it's unlikely until next month. Till then, the town will have to adapt. It will have to ski through this crisis. Except it will be a bumpy ride instead of a snowy descent. Over a decade ago, an 11-year-old girl visited McDonald's, the fast food joint. Like most kids, Antonia Brown ordered a Happy Meal. I'm sure you've heard of it. A Happy Meal is a meal curated for children. It comes with a toy and a choice. The toy is based on gender preferences. For example, a Barbie is for girls and Hot Wheels is for boys. Now, Brown has asked or had asked, rather, for a so-called boy's toy. Despite the request, McDonald's gave her a girl's toy, and this unsettled her, so she wrote to the CEO. She said if McDonald's held a job interview, would they ask if someone wanted a man's job or a woman's job? And this made waves. It led McDonald's to change their policy. Today, McDonald's employees still provide the choice of toys, but by themes, not by gender. It was a big win not just for brown, but for toys everywhere. Because this episode urged people to question the culture of gendered toys. In the past decade, some of the largest toy retailers have made moves. They got rid of signs labeling toys for boys or for girls. They traded pink and blue shelves for a neutral look. Toys themselves have transformed. There are gender-neutral Barbies and Lego sets with a lesser gender bias. Governments have stepped in too. France has a toy charter. It demands that toy makers avoid gender stereotyping. Most recently, California has joined this club. It has passed a new state law this month. It applies to toy retailers with at least 500 employees. They're now required to have a gender neutral toy section. It will hold toys for all genders. Now to many, this may seem like a trivial issue. And we are no flag bearers of wokeism either. But toys are serious business. Decades of research proves this. Every time children play with toys, they learn something. Dolls teach kids cognitive sequencing and verbal skills. Building blocks and puzzles teach spatial skills. Reading maps and hitting targets build cognitive skills. Yet all toys are not treated equally. Girls get the dolls, boys get the maps and both genders lose out. You may say, girls want dolls because they are more nurturing than boys. Boys are more aggressive, they want guns and cars. And this may seem true, but it's only because of influence. From parents, from peers, or the environment, not gender. These gender tropes do not reflect in biology. Evidence suggests that in terms of traits and abilities, boys and girls are more alike than different. They're equally likely to play with a toy car. Yet, it is traditionally a toy for boys. A car is traditionally a toy for boys when there is nothing traditional about it. Gender toys are, are a recent phenomenon, all thanks, thanks to marketing. Back in the 18th century, girls and boys wore pink and blue alike. In fact, pink was a color for boys and men. Pink comes from red, which is a symbol of passion and aggression. By the first half of the 20th century, blue was seen as a color of girls until the first half because of its association with Virgin Mary. And toys were not advertised for specific genders up until this point. 
They came in happy colors too, green, blue, yellow. But by the late 1900s, women of the American high society loved pink. So did the women's movements. So by the 1970s, pink was considered a feminine color. And this segregated the colors. It trickled down to toys. Marketers acted quickly, and today the toy industry is worth $107 billion, all while there are two kingdoms of pink and blue. There is a big wall in between, and children are not supposed to cross it. But who says they can't? Who says they should not? Toy stores have become a color-coded minefield. Demining will not be child's play. But it's about time we made a start. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In New York, a secret tunnel built beneath a historic Brooklyn synagogue led to a brawl. In China, an artist carves a lifelike dragon on a frozen river. And the Moroccan trade minister addressed Prime Minister Narendra Modi as the Prime Minister of Bharat at the vibrant Gujarat summit. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1946. The first meeting of the United Nations General Assembly began in London. Delegates representing 51 nations attended the session. The scope and purpose of the UN was decided in this meeting. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Honorable Sri Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of Bharat.